Hey everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody is having uh, a great start to your year. I hope that all the things that you have set out to do, uh, you're well on your way. I hope that you have a level of intent that is committed to finishing what you have started. Uh, look, you know the routine. If you like what you hear and see here, click the like button, click the share button and subscribe if you believe in the work we do at the odyssey project uh, in research in advocacy in community assistance uh, in developing and protecting the black family and so much more look in the description box and contribute uh yeah i'm here to address uh this whole cat williams interview with Shannon Sharp and what I see beyond what is superficial and what everybody is uh, talking about, you know, there is what's going to be considered, you know, the gossip and the sensationalism. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some things that unfold here that I think that can easily go by the wayside. But hey, man, this interview to me was unbelievable uh not because of its sensationalism but because of so many things being unveiled uh and again there are going to be some people who are going to immediately not like uh what happened or what they heard and predominantly it's going to be because he said something about someone you like it's simply the way we are programmed in that we literally have, because of our history, we have learned to live vicariously through blacks who we believe will do better than we ever will. And so we give a great deal of pass and leeway uh, and latitude to athletes, to uh, entertainers, to film uh, actors and actresses. And we develop a sense of identity and connectivity uh, with them. And so when someone comes at them, uh, you know, we take a problem with it. And again, I'm not here to judge anything. I think life is simply designed by God, the creator of the universe, to judge. It's not up to me to judge someone. It is up to me to call a spade a spade. It is up to me to speak on things and <clears throat> there are some people that were mentioned here that i have called out long before this interview uh because i saw their behavior at the top of the list is steve harvey uh and anybody who's actually followed or been a fan of and i'm not here to tell you who to be a fan of i'm not here to tell you who to like who i'm am, what i am here to tell you to do is to start to search the behavior of people and ask yourself is it really aligning with what my value and my faith and my aspirations align with? Or is it, if I'm honest with myself, does the behavior seem shady? Does the behavior seem unacceptable? If anyone other than this person was doing it, would I think it's okay? But I've been calling out Steve Harvey, and there's no questioning that there's an alliance between Steve and um, said and um basically Ricky Smiley has been a protege so somewhat of Steve and uh the people that are involved there and um they've actually if you watch them and listen to them talk they talk about it um it's not done in a sense that it's exposing the negative side of their alliance but it, it's no doubt that they have been pulled along by one another. Um, but it's just a fraction of what this guy talked about. And my, my, my thing is, first and foremost, the whole thing, and I've already seen where Ricky Smiley has already hit Twitter. Um, you know, they say hit dogs holler. Uh, I don't, you know, my whole thing is I – acknowledge when something is funny and you know sometimes the person who is saying the funny thing is somebody that i like as a person 
And sometimes it's just a person saying something that's funny. Um, and again, you know, I'm not a comedian. I'm not an actor. Uh, I'm not a celebrity. And so I can't, you know, judge people on how good they are at something in their craft when it's not my craft. I spend my time beating on my craft to be the best person I can be in the field that I have chosen. But I do get to call a spade a spade. And I think uh, whether you want to take everything at face value that Kat said, whether you want to sit down and you uh, anatomize, break it down and uh, pick at it, that's your, that's your that's your right to do so. I will acknowledge that there was somebody literally present fact checking, and I think there were some things numerically off, like some years here or some there. But the bit basic gist of it is, he brought you something that people have been talking about for years, and that's the gatekeepers. That's the people who will give you a short path into something that you don't really have to work for, but it comes at a price. My whole reason for being here now is in this conversation, he exposed something rather uh, ingenuously. Uh, he exposed something that I think that we don't pay attention to, and that is the power of the media to control, manipulate, establish paradigms and write narratives. And if we're not careful, we, we, we will not pay attention to the gatekeepers. You know, we tore Monique up when she talked about what Taraji is talking about now. Steve called her in and told her basically on a show in front of a in front of a bunch of white people that you forget integrity. Basically was his statement, forget integrity. You got to get the bag. Until you get the bag, you hell with integrity. It's basically his statement. And she's saying she's standing on principle and, 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 and she's going to call a spade a spade. And and I remember how she got ripped up because she didn't do it this way, because she didn't do it that way. And I'm not saying everything she did and how she did it was the best way to do it. What I'm saying is when you get tired of getting kicked and the one thing she kept saying is I am the most decorated female comedian on the planet. And when you go back to look at the awards, when you go back and look at everything she is. There's no other female comedian that is as decorated as she is. And yet here we are having that conversation. Here comes Taraji, a person in her own right who's paid her, paid her dues and worked her way through saying the same thing. But she says it in a way that's more docile and vulnerable. And so it's received and it's given attention. Uh, and I think that we have to be aware of that. But a lot of the time, what you're going to see is if you aren't paying a dues, meaning that if you're not allowing yourself to be uh, an element of manipulation, an element of control, an element of misdirection and misinformation, mis uh, miseducation, then you find you've got to always go. And I always said before I got to really understand who Cat Williams was and to read up on him and understand him. I always said the guy has to know something because they stay trying to make him look crazy. Come to find out that all these uh, drug, uh, drug induced stupors that he's supposed to be on was uh, a farce because the dude doesn't do hard drugs. But how many people was believing it? You know, uh, that his arrests were basically either for weapon possession and he admits I'm going to protect myself. Uh, and I'm a person who believes in a person's right to do that. Um, and our weed possession, and, you know, and here we are now, how many black men are spending time for doing what people are getting paid million, billions to do now. But my whole thing is not, the, the 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 everybody's probably looking at the sensationalism when i sit up and i see this i see the unveiling of a darkness i see the unveiling of a bunch of people that have been given a position that has allowed them to feed us a bunch of bs that doesn't actually apply and work in our situations and i'll start with steve i look at uh and one thing that's always bother me is how Ricky Smiley pushes this Eurocentric idea. 
And the Eurocentric idea is, you know, you got to do like this when you show up for this. You got to be like this. And remember, it was Steve's, uh, man, I can't, and I know the guy's name. Uh, and it'll probably pop up somewhere later down the line. But uh, when Steve was walking away from his morning show that Ricky Smiley ends up picking up, one of the things they told him he needed to do. Now, this is a radio show. Check this out. You know, get rid of the dreads or the braids or whatever it was Ricky was Ricky had at the time. And, and you know, told him you need to do all this and all this. And I get there. Certain things you need to do. And I'm not judging anybody on what you want to do. But I really, truly believe you have to embrace who you are and know who you are. One of the biggest things that I push when it comes to black men. And this needs to be the same with black women, by the way. But one of the things I push consistently is being aware of who you are one of the biggest problems we have as blacks is we don't know who we are we don't know why we're exceptional we don't know what makes us beautiful we don't know because everything is about what they say what's professional the eurocentric idea of what's professional the eurocentric idea of what's classy the eurocentric idea of uh, uh of you know uh, what's acceptable, what's beautiful, and everything else. And then we judge ourselves based on this, and we try our best to fit into something we were never meant to fit into, and we will never truly be allowed into. And what it does, it robs us of our chances and our abilities of using our great creativity, which is unparalleled. Uh, uh, we were talking the other day, and we were talking about superpowers. Um, and, and one of the guys uh, chimed in and said that, uh, every racial enclave has a superpower. Um, and he, he sort of mentioned a few what Asians do. Asians are unparalleled in um, replication. They can take something somebody else made and make it over. And that's what they do. They replicate. Uh, Latinos have this work ethic and the ability and willingness to work with one another to accomplish co common goals. Whites are... Um, basically those who have mastered taking what other people do and basically uh, usurping it, using it. Uh, they play the long game. Uh, they look at it and play the long game. But when it comes to us, there's no one that can even lay a finger on us when it comes to creativity. Think of all of the inventions and where they really truly originate. Our level of creativity is unbelievable, but it is always suppressed and push to the side because we are trying to be something that we're not. Something else that he talked about um, that uh, towards the end, he says divisiveness always divides. And I look at what is being done and a lot of the people he mentioned are a part of this uh, process of constantly pushing divisiveness. Divisiveness always divides. The divisiveness we're seeing in the gender war, the divisiveness we're seeing and um, the expanding gap between our older heads and our younger, uh, younger generations and the divisiveness that is constantly circulating amongst us, even as men, because we are driven to compete with one another versus work with one another. And I think that we have a problem in that. Uh, I thought that was powerful. Um, you know, he, he but he, I mean, he touched on Cedric the Entertainer, phase on Love. He touched on Kevin Hart. He had Harvey Weinstein, Steve Harvey, uh, Wanda Smith. And my thing, Michael Blackson, and Michael Blackson's another one that's already weighed in on Twitter, uh, you know, taking a defensive posture. And my whole thing is, I'm not here as a champion for uh, Cat Williams. I like Cat Williams. Uh, what I am a champion is of is truth, and I think he gave his truth. I think he presented it, and I think basically what he did was draw a sand in the line and say, you know what? Y'all been saying this. Y'all been putting this. I'm calling it out. Prove me wrong. And that's the thing about something being on that level is when I say it, people are going to have an opportunity to fact check it. People are going to have an opportunity to come and rebut it. And my thing is just based on the little I know but no, I know it's going to be hard to rebut a lot of that. Now, you can come back and you can nitpick it. You can come back and say, hey, this is just somebody who's bitter. This is somebody who's, you know, whatever. 
My thing is, what I take from it is, I think he actually represents proof that we don't have to play by their rules and we can still win. You're going to come out banged up and beat up. You're going to come out misunderstood and mishandled, but you can still win. You can still uh, retain your integrity of who you are as a person. And when I see Cat Williams, that's what I see. I see a person who didn't bow down. When I look at Dave Chappelle, I look at a person who didn't bow down, who didn't let someone bend him over, literally and figuratively. And the same thing with Cat Williams. He kept talking about uh, protecting his virgin hole. And he studied putting it out there for you that there's this thing that's going on and it's becoming more and more exposed. And he was very upfront about a couple of people, you know, and he, he, he did it in sort of a passing, you know, with uh, Bishop Jakes and uh, Diddy and all that. Now, when it comes to Bishop Jakes, there's a lot of people because of your faith and because of the long history and everything. My whole thing is I'm not here to judge another man outside of the fact that we need to call a spade a spade. My problem with Diddy isn't the gayness. My problem with Diddy is his lethal path and the amount of bodies, literal bodies, that he's left behind him, and the amount of pain and hurt that is going on, and the legend of the parties, that if you know anyone anywhere close to the circle, you've heard about it, and that's that. I'm not here to give Bishop Jakes a pass. I'm also not here to crucify him. I think his situation is with God and the church, uh, I think the church has to hold people accountable. Uh, I think that we have to be reasonable in saying, okay, uh, are we going to give him the benefit of the doubt? Uh, I've been around and I've been, you know, in the church in a very high position and I've seen what happens behind uh, the veneer. And so nothing surprises me. Uh, I told some very important people, include him, 20 plus years ago that the church's slip was hanging and that the information age was going to blow the doors off the church and we were going to have a mass exodus. That's happening now. Um, it's going to be harder to hide things and we need to be more open and honest. And again, it's not my job to say what's supposed to happen to him. It's the church's job to deal with it. It's life's job to deal with it. I'm a flawed man. I am a man that is not perfect. So I don't sit up and expect no other man to be perfect. Same thing with Cat Williams, same thing with Steve Harvey, same thing with all of them. Well, my problem is, is not with your imperfection. My problem is with your intention. And I truly believe, and it's just my belief, I'm one person. I believe that Cat Williams has a good intention in what he does. The fact that he goes around and blesses comedians without ever walking up and doing it, he's not doing it for, uh, uh, like he said, the gram. He's not doing it for the gram. He's not sitting up doing it to get, he's sending somebody else in there and sliding them some paper and saying, hey, look, you did a good set, congratulations. And they say they know who it is. And, it, and this is not the first time I've heard this story. I've heard this story about Cat Williams multiple times that this dude is in the audience and then all of a sudden you, you finish your set and some chick comes up to you, and let me replace that, some young lady comes up to you and blesses you and said, this is for somebody who just wanted to bless you. And you eventually realize that after talking to another cat in another city or on another night and they tell you somebody did it to them and you start to realize the common denominator is that cat was in the audience. And so this isn't new and, and, and I'm glad that Shannon brought that up. But my issue, and if you go back and you look, my issue with not just comedians, anybody with a platform, Jason Whitlock, uh, oftentimes Stephen A. Smith that have platforms and push this fall in line narrative, push this, you know, you got to play by their rules. If you got to do what they say to get what you want rules is because they took that chart cut. They paid the toll at the gate. He kept talking about gatekeepers. And if you paid very close attention, he was telling you some of the gatekeepers, Tyler Perry, 
Oprah Winfrey. And my whole thing is, do they give you things that enjoy? I mean, Tyler Perry has made us laugh for a long time. Uh, Oprah Winfrey gave us a whole new outlook and view on what's possible for a black person. Uh, not all things done with standing. And so, you know, we've got some great work from them to a certain extent, but that can't be the only thing we see. Again, um, if you take away Madea and you take away um, the raunchy black man mishandling the black woman and the black woman rising again out of his repertoire, what do you have? And my thing is, I think he's gifted enough and I think he now has the means to give us something that is more representative of our community. The fact is black men do work. The fact is black men do love black women. The fact is black men do take care of their kids. The fact is the average black man is doing his best to hold his own in a world that has put a target on his back. Let's do a little bit more of that. Um, the fact that he literally stood up and stood up and said, uh, I don't want to be in a movie where a black man gets raped. I don't think anything funny, uh, there's anything funny about anybody being raped. But I definitely don't want to be in a situation where there's a black man being raped. Now, you got to understand, this is at a time where he is admittedly saying that he doesn't have loot. And he needs to get his mouth fixed. He needs to get a place for, the, for him and his kids. But he's literally saying, I've got to stand on this. And in that, that's character. You know, it doesn't show up in a nice suit, six foot one all the time. But that's the idea. If the guy is six foot one and he's wearing a nice cut suit and he's clean shaven, there's something honorable about that. And that's literally a narrative that's been pushed that makes you feel certain ways about certain people. One of the things and challenges that I've had to do, I've lost money because uh, I'm nine times out of ten uh, going to have a T-shirt or a hoodie and a cap on. It doesn't change the level of my brilliance. It doesn't change the level of my knowledge. It doesn't, it doesn't impact my skill set. It's simply a parameter that people are using to control. If I can make him get in this box, I can make him get in another one. If I can make him get in that one, I can make him get in another one. And the thing is, uh, what I found is the same thing that Cat found, that once you have the goal, you make the rules. Who you has the goal makes the rules. So when I when people deal with me, they deal with a person that's one of the best in this damn world at doing what I do. I don't have the fame of some of the people that are running around here because I don't want the fame. I'm not chasing fame. I'm not investing in PR and in, in, in public uh, PR and uh, in a publicist to become famous. I want to be impactful. Do I need to expand my reach? Absolutely. Whether it's as a life strategist, whether it's as a performance psychologist, whether it is in the uh, scope of what I do in trauma healing, if it's what I do in the addressing of issues in the black community, I want to be effective and I want to expand my reach, but I have no desire to sit up and succumb or break myself because the moment that I give in, and, and the thing is, it's not about being uh, recalcitrant. It's about sitting up and understanding who I am. I'm comfortable in what I do and, and, and how I move. Can I clean, can I clean up? I absolutely can. And in the right situations, I do. I'm not going to an all formal event in a cap and a hoodie. I didn't show up to my daughter's uh, debutante. Uh, ball in a cap and a hoodie. I had a tuxedo on. Uh, but as uh, if I'm doing a business deal with you, what I'm wearing at the time really actually doesn't matter. Now, an event is one thing, sitting down and connected to me. And my thing is I've broken stereotypes by simply showing up because you're looking at me and you're judging me by the tattoos. And you, you find out that I'm gifted, literally. <laughs> find out that I am good at what I do beyond what you could possibly ever imagine. Because I'm in the room with you because somebody told you I was that dude. 
But when I showed up, it threw you off because you're expecting somebody that falls in line. Well, same thing with Cat Williams, same thing with everything. I think that we'd have to look at the integrity of what's going on out there. And I look at what he did is he showed up in this truest state and who he is, and he defended himself through truth. And the theme of this was what? Truth. And so when I look at things is I hope that Everybody has fun watching it, but I hope that they undress it for what it really is. What it really is, is a dissertation on the disturbance and the disruption and the malfeasance of celebrity and how people will chase it at all costs and that they will cross you out in order to do it. And this is not only happening in celebrity, but my whole thing is, I think why it was important for him uh, to do it and to address it is that we give these passes to celebrities. And it's the passes that we give celebrities that give them the license to come in and mislead us. We have so connected through this vicarious mechanism of connectivity, of living our lives through them, We've become so engrossed in their success because it's how we are experiencing success that we don't want to see that end. We don't want to see it crash. We don't want to see it smudged and marred. And what we do is we give a pass. I think we did R. Kelly a major disservice by not sitting, by, by not addressing it. I think that um, that's just one instance. I think that every time we look up and we see this, something else he said, and it was just in passing and he did it real lightly. And he did it without trying to step on anybody else's foot, but he made it very clear. He has no interest in anything other than a black woman. And again, I'm not here to judge my brothers who choose outside of it. I'm, I'm here to say that there's a beauty in that type of love, that type of trust. And he told you why. He, he's, he's afraid. And, and he's afraid of white women in, 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 in that sense. And I, I get why. Because no one is more lethal and dangerous than a white woman who chooses to weaponize her whiteness. That's been the way it's been since slavery to sit up and say, they did this to me, or this happens. Your ass is grass. It's just the way it is. Emmett Till, you can say Jonathan Majors, you can say everything. And even when we thought, and you got to think about it. It's been that way so long that even when a person who just totally didn't want to have anything to do with black women, had had two children by a black woman, left her, went to a white woman, had two more kids, OJ. When he got acquitted, the split was obvious, and very few people understood why. Most people just automatically had, but the reason we were with him is because so often, the black woman is the victim and the black man gets hung. This has happened so long and so often. And so what happened? He got off, but he didn't. That's how dangerous of this woman. And, and, and don't get me wrong. I'm not supporting domestic violence. I'm not supporting uh, a black man. Definitely not supporting a black man harming a black woman. But I'm not supporting a man harming any woman. But what I'm trying to get you to understand is when it's a white woman. Your ass is grass. And there's enough black women who need strong, successful black men that we don't have to venture over into their world. Uh, and this whole idea about I don't get to choose who I fall in love with is absolute bullshit. You don't choose to love, fall in love with somebody that's been to prison 20 times. You don't choose to fall in some love with someone that don't make a certain amount of money. You, you got standards of what you're going to even allow into your, your, your area of who you're considering as a mate. So you definitely can sit up and say, this is not part of my curriculum. This is not part of the standard. I have a standard. It's required. The first requisite is she's got to be a sister. I mean, that's got to be evidence of African descent. 
And then we start from there. And the fact that he brought that out, I think that's important. I think we need to love on our women. Again, I'm not judging, uh, begrading, or saying anything. I have friends who are interracial couples. Uh, but they also know my stance on this. They absolutely know my stance. I don't bend my thing. And so that's why I think I have an appreciation for Caddis because he didn't bend. He didn't bend to get the money. He told you he turned down $50 million. How many times? Four times, I believe he said. And it's because what they wanted him to do in the movie. I think one, I think each time it was a dress. I have, you know... Never been in a situation where I could turn down $50 million. But what I have been in a situation is where I have clients who are international clients that represent a significant part of my revenue stream come to me and say, hey, look, we see that you're doing this, that you're making this type of content concerning black, white relationships. And I think it's sort of divisive. And I think that it can be very controversial. And we really don't want our clients to see that. We need you to tone it down. We need you to take X amount of videos down. We need you to go and remove this article off this site. We need you to do this. And I'm like, absolutely not. I know if they remove their money, it's going to be uh, a challenge to replace it, especially in the short term. But you have to have something you stand on. You have to have something you believe in. You got to have something that's bigger than you. And so I've done this and I've lost at least two international clients that were a significant part of not only my revenue stream, they were a big part of my recovery when I had to start rebuilding my business over again. They were a big part and big reason why I could. So I had a relationship with them. This wasn't just client. This is I had developed a relationship. They could depend on me delivering on what I say I was going to do at a very high level. And they consistently paid like they were supposed to. And so to sit up and see that relationship turn the way it turned. And it didn't end volatility volatility like i hate you you hate me it was like hey i wish you the best they say we wish you the best and it was just simply they were where they were i was where i was but you have to make those choices i commend them for that we need more people who are willing to do that and it's not the most expedient in the sense of how you get there but it is the most solid and foundational because at the end of the day i have to look myself in the mirror in my imperfections in my fallibility and say, I stood the best I could on what was principal to me. And I think that that is what it looks like. It does, again, it doesn't look like the clean cut dude in the suit. It looks like the little dude that was on that, 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 that set with Shannon that, you know, doesn't represent the stereotypical idea of manhood in America. But is going to war and going to blows with anybody that crosses a line that he considers to be a standard. And I think that's something that we need to be looking at. You know, yeah, was people were, were people exposed? He it, it, number one is nobody's perfect. But you better be very careful about how you present your story. You better be very careful about how, you know, my thing is, you're not going to get through this life without making some bad choices. You're not going to get through this life without having some people that are not going to be happy with the outcome of your interaction with them. Uh, whether it's in a relationship, whether it's in a business relationship, whether it's uh, in passing or whatever, that's that's just the reality of it. But you better be in a place where you've done the best you can to be the best you can, that your reputation is a lit is the culmination of a list of doing things right as much as you can possibly do it so that when people see your shortcomings, when people see your mistakes, they know it's an anomaly. It's not who you are. It's your fallibility and your humanity happening. And it's okay to be human, but it's not okay to be an asshole. It's not okay to go behind somebody's back that you're supposed that's supposed to be your boy and try to undercut them for a movie role. And that's not new news for those of you who aren't aware. That's old news. That's the reason that Bernie and uh, Steve stopped talking is because Steve tried to undercut him for that role. And to hear Steve say he didn't want to be in movies, well, that that's not the truth. And again, let's talk about what's going on and why and all these other different things. And I love the fact that he recognized uh, Mark Curry because I think that 
Mark Kerr is one of the greats, and uh, you know nobody's checking for him now because of the steam engine that's moving, where people are being manufactured instead of developing, and they are given plays instead of developing, and then they are writing stories and backgrounds that aren't true, and they're selling them to the masses and misleading and misguiding. Again, nobody's perfect. You're going to hear me say that. And I've always said that. And I've always told you, I do not speak, preach, teach from a platform of perfection. I've said that in the pulpit in church. I've said that on countless lectures. I, I have said that on numerous videos. That's not what, what, what qualifies me. What qualifies me is my commitment, my passion, and my expertise. And that's why I'm where I'm at and why I'm presenting and what I'm sharing. Uh, not my perfection, not that I've mastered anything outside of the skill set that I have to share and to do and to teach what I want to teach. I'm learning, I'm growing, um, and, and I'm building. But my thing is... If you don't take nothing away from what Cat did, take this. You got to be responsible for vetting the information you receive. You got to be responsible for who you get a pass into your life. You got to be responsible for what you're willing to accept and what you're not willing to accept. Then remove the celebrity and apply that to your life practically and say, there's got to be a standard by which you operate. There's got to be things you will tolerate and you won't tolerate. There has to be a level that exceeds that which exists. In other words, the only way you get better is you got to raise the bar. Just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean that it's what's going to take you to the next level or what will truly uh, actualize the potential that you have on the inside of you. You've got to want to do more, be more. Uh, every day I wake up and my goal is to be a better person than the person that went to sleep that night. I mean, be a better person. Every night when I wake up, the person that goes to bed has to be better than the person that woke up some way. By consuming something, by learning something, by engaging something, by hitting the gym, by going for a jog or a walk, by talking to people who have information that I need, uh, on and on and on. It's about growth. It's about development. And I think that um, in, in, in all of the drama that played out in that interview, I think that's a theme as well is... How are you building? How are you growing? Uh, one thing I noticed as well with that was the somberness of his childhood. He didn't go into deep detail, but obviously that's a dark part of his life. And obviously it's set up as a catalyst. And um, it's amazing um, what you can do when you decide that you're going to change. And his story is, to me, phenomenal. Uh, again, this isn't me sitting up saying everything that was said is gospel. Uh, I wasn't there. I can only go by where I hear and the things that I've read and I know and draw some lines and draw some conclusions. What I am here saying is there are a bunch of truths that did come out that need to be given validity and need to be something that we measure and we ask ourselves, are we living at this type of level? Are we living at this type of standard? Man, uh, I think that, I don't, I mean, that's, we are, we're what, four days into the year, that's probably the best interview you're going to get this year. And somebody will come along and probably prove me wrong. But, I mean, right out the box, uh, Shannon brought brought this in. And I, I, I have to think that they had some idea, but I don't think they had any idea uh, the level at which it would uh, go to. But the entire interview is on uh Shannon's podcast. It's on YouTube. Um, it's worth watching. I'm not big on sitting up on doing, spending a whole lot of time. Uh, but I actually had a guy that I'm very close to. He's a very close friend and he's actually older than me. He's like almost 10 years older than me. So he's in his sixties and he was telling me, man, you need to watch this. He says, doc, with what you do, you need to watch this. And what's going to happen is I'm going to literally sit down and look at the notes that I took from this. And uh, I'm going to have a probably massively uh, 
transformative uh, perception of what I just experienced once I really get a chance to break it down and really study it and, and toward it. But I don't spend a whole lot of time watching uh, videos um, if they aren't informative, if they aren't uh, information I need to grow in what I do. Um, you know, uh, I'll watch clips of comedy specials because I love to laugh. I need the laughter. It's positive energy. Uh, it's something that I think we all do. Laughter is literally uh, an igniter of the body's ability to heal. And I think that we need to spend more time doing that. But just sitting around chasing uh, in, uh, Internet and social media content. Um, I create a lot of it because it's what I do and I'm trying to share a message. I'm trying to help people change their lives. I'm trying to help people grow. I'm trying to empower my community and so much more. So I create a lot of content, which means I don't have a whole lot of time to consume crap. So when I take my time to invest in something, it's because I believe it has value. This to me definitely has value outside of its shock value, outside of a sensational side of it. It has a lot of value and I've just started to examine. And so I'm going to go back and look at my notes and I may have some things to share in the coming days. Or at some point when I see or, or experience an epiphany uh, about what was said or what went on, or how it can be applied. Uh, but the thing is that comes from this is we need to be responsible for who we allow to influence our community and our lives and how they do it and what they said and what's the agenda being pushed who are the gatekeepers and who are they letting in the gate and why are they letting them in the gate and i think we will gain a lot from that again uh, that's me and that's my perspective on it uh, from my experience uh, in this life at what i do what I've observed, what I've learned, and what I teach. Uh, and it's just that. Um, so on that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. As I said before, if you like what you've heard, hit the like button, uh, hit the share button, hit the subscribe button. If you believe in the work we're doing as an organization, if you believe in what I'm doing as an advocate, um, as a scholar, as a researcher, as a program developer, uh, for the issues, the enigmatic issues we face in our community, Look in the description box uh, and give. Uh, none of this stuff is done free. But on that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. Um, I hope to see you soon. You guys take care. I'm out. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.